this edition of Ultrasound. After 16 years in the music business, 1996 found Metallica ready to set speed aside, cut their hair, and blast the billboard charts with a mellower dose of metal called Lowe's. Soon after, they ushered in Metal Palooza and a world tour, then took aim at Reload, an album comprised of unfinished material from Load. And once again, they scored another bullseye on the Billboard charts. We have a desire to keep pushing the boundaries, and the only thing that will limit us will be our own imagination. Over 9 million albums later, Ultrasound takes you inside the studio during the prolific sessions that introduced fans to the new Metallica, Locked and loaded. I think a lot of bands without knowing it, kind of dig themselves too much of a rut. They're just a little afraid to expand or, or to take a step forward. I don't think we've ever been afraid of that. There's a certain dynamic between the four of us that, that seems to like keep the spark alive. The thing that has kept Metallica going so long and it's kind of been our secret, I mean, is how you know, everybody always wants to be there for the other three guys. Nobody ever wants to let the other three guys down. We get older and that's okay. We change and that's okay, as long as it's natural. Metallica has always been the thinking dude's metal band, punky but intricate too. Early Metallica tracks, in fact, were so fiendishly multi-metered the guys themselves could barely keep up in concert. But that's history. It's not real raw in terms of it just has like two guitars, uh, drums and bass, a couple of vocal effects and stuff like that. Whereas the rest of the album ranges over many stylistic strategies, right? Well, well put. I like that one. That's a pretty good one. Well put there. <laughs> uh, in other words, it's a complete mess. Three, four. His last album, still on the Billboard Top 100 chart five years after its release, Metallica has stripped its surefire sound way down for an unusual new album called Load. There was no big plan in the end on how they were all supposed to sound, so we just yeah, concentrated song by song and, and just let them go. Every song evokes a certain type of mood. It's not, you know, consistently just like pounding heavy metal thunder all the way. I think the one thing we had to do was just be looser, be more go for attitude, go for vibe, and go for something that was more of a band sound. I think listening to some of the earlier records, it definitely sounds like the Ulrich Hetfield experience. <laughs> The Hetfield Ulrich experience began in Los Angeles in 1981, a time when glam was king, or queen, and two young locals found themselves united in dismay, angry young singer James Hetfield and transplanted Danish drummer Lars Ulrich. I came from Europe, I was listening to a lot of the European stuff that was going on at the time I landed in the land of Ario Speedwagon and Sticks and Kansas, and I'm just going like, ah! We loved punk music, and it just didn't have enough musicianship to it, so we basically added some. Hetfield and Ulrich hooked up with Dave Mustaine, a speed demon guitarist with a major mouth, and brought in bassist Ron McGovney to form the maiden lineup of Metallica in October 1981. People came to our uh, gigs not knowing what they were expecting. They'd come to that club no matter what, just to hang and hang with their friends and see who's, you know, looking prettier, you know, that night. And We got very annoyed with that, and we'd sing louder and, and play faster, and that was, that's kind of how it, I think it helped develop our style. So Metallica was working, but something was lacking in the band's lineup. And while watching another group at the famous Whiskey one night, they discovered what it was, bassist Cliff Burton. So we saw this big mop going, and you know, we had this wah going, and our fingers and hair were flying, and we just thought that was so cool and so unique, and we had to, we had to have the guy. He really had been studying music uh, at a college up in, in San Francisco and stuff and really started 
introducing James and me to things like harmonies and melodies <laughs> and stuff like that. My name is Donna Davis and I'm here with Metallica, the hot new heavy metal band from L.A. And let's have them start with their name and what they do in the band. And let's start with you. James Hetfield, rhythm guitar and vocals. Lars Ulrich, drums and punk. Dave Mustaine, lead guitar. Cliff Burton, bass guitar. <laughs> By this point, Dave Mustaine's enthusiasm for cocktails was driving his bandmates nuts. So after securing a record deal and heading for New York to make their first album with metal promoter Johnny Z, they decided to take action. As soon as we got to New York, it's like, hi, Johnny Z, or, you know, we're Metallica, and uh, what kind of sack are lead guitar player? Whoa, you know. <laughs> In giving Dave Mustaine the axe, Hetfield and Ulrich were, shall we say, unhampered by sentiment. We had booked him a bus ticket like 10 in the morning, and like at 9.15 or something, it's like, Dave, wake up, we gotta talk. And um, so basically we woke him up, and he was still sort of rubbing you know, sleep out of his eyes, babe, you, I, you gotta go home. And then the... the, the and you gotta go on a bus. Well, well yeah, the, Dave, you gotta go home, and then the, the infamous, I mean, this lingers, this is like famous, this question, he goes, when does my plane leave? And... <laughs> Dave, uh, well, here's part two of the bad news. And so, basically, you just got fired, and you have four days on a Greyhound bus clear across America to sit and, and revel in that. I got, I mean, actually got the call on April, April Fool's Day, so that was an April Fool's Day joke. <laughs> I was on the can. About midnight, Kurt shows up, and uh, he sets up his equipment. It was actually the first time I'd ever been out of California. <laughs> really? Yeah. I was, I was scared of this. And... Um, like New York, it's like, wow, this place is really big and dirty. The first song we played was Seek and Destroy, and we got to the guitar solo, and 10 seconds into it, me and James just looked at each other, and that was it, done, end of story. <laughs> kind of a thing about you could never stray, you know, I mean, we've always strayed and all over the place. On the way to somewhere, it's always the best time you just come up with lyrics, so a paper right there ready to write away, and a little pen handy right there, going back and forth to Lars's, I'd be late going there, stop at Wendy's, I'd be eating a burger, talking on the phone and writing down lyrics. What's on your mind writing-wise these days? What are, what are the themes of some of these songs? Themes lyrically? Yeah. Uh, vagueness. <laughs> I don't want to really give any preconceptions, but it's more deep, uh, personal stuff. That's it's, it's, I had to kind of go visit some kind of messed up places within where I thought, well, I'm, I'm all better now. I don't have to write that kind of crap anymore. But I mean, once you're messed up, you're, you know. <laughs> A lot of those old records were so thematic, and there was all these visuals and all these major, almost, you know, messages and all this kind of heavy-duty political stuff and I, I really got kind of bored with that and I think at the same time James felt more comfortable opening up and letting some of his really in the most bizarre stuff out. I just wish that people would just like go past you know what they what, what they think Metallica is about you know he, you know heavy metal thunder and lightning you know and Satan <laughs> and listen to the music. There was always in in harder rock kind of a thing about you could never stray you know I mean we've always strayed and all over the place Metallica started straying on its second album Ride the Lightning the band had signed with new management and a new major label and it wasn't about to start bowing down before the usual hard and fast metal stereotypes in 1984 when we put a ballad Fade to Black on our second record I mean people were freaking okay and we just said right there this is how it's gonna be there are no parameters that keep us in Releasing its third album, Master of Puppets, in 1986, Metallica embarked on a career-changing tour with metal god Ozzy Osbourne. 
the Puppets album rose to number 29 on the Billboard chart, and with this success, the band soon found itself answering to the inevitable charge of selling out. We do what we want to do, you know. If they consider that selling out, then uh, whatever. Metallica's success was unique in that rock radio gave the group zip in the way of airplay. Radio didn't want us, and, and uh, <laughs> was, I mean, we kept, you know, sending them tapes. As for the hot new promotional medium of music video, well, Metallica dismissed it as lame. Oh, you had, like, these guys playing, and then they did have all these girls in bikinis, you know, prancing all around. That became like a, a rock standard for a while, and uh, we didn't want anything to do with that. Metallica was also fighting the popular image of metal itself, of a dark cult genre devoted to death and Satanism, music for losers. You say one more thing about Metallica, I'm going to slam you in the neck. <laughs> yeah. Go on with your bad self, Beavis. <laughs> A ton of bad luck struck Metallica itself on September 27, 1986. While touring Europe, the band's bus skidded off an icy road, and bassist Cliff Burton was killed. Did the band think at any time, like, maybe we should take six months off? No. We knew that if we did that, we'd probably start wallowing in our, our, in our grief and depression so we thought we unanimously decided that we should just keep on working double-edged sword of that was that it was like whoever we got in the band would be at the receiving end of torment and torture and for years to come just because he was the replacement for cliff that lucky man turned out to be metallica fan jason newstead plucked from the lineup of a phoenix band called flotsam and jetsam Looking back on it, the first couple of years were rough. Actually, the first couple of years and couple of years were pretty rough. When they wanted to be ugly, they were ugly and didn't really, you know, that was just that. You didn't beat him up or anything, did you? No, we didn't beat him up. Well, mentally, we beat him up. <laughs> but, I mean, come on, you know, he walked off, off the street into a dream situation, so we, we had to let him know that it, it's not this easy, brother. <laughs> I had to really keep uh, a straight head professional. I really had to see further you know i had to like look beyond all these kind of things these bumps and these curves and obstacles i really had to look beyond that there's a lot of them in the beginning it's come a long way and i think in a bizarre way this is the most um we've ever been a band right now what is democracy got something to do with young men killing each other i think in 1988, Metallica released a new album, and Justice For All mounted a worldwide tour and finally came up with a video concept they liked. The story of a young man who goes off to war and comes back a vegetable. I can remember uh, sitting on the couch and one would come on and then afterwards a DJ would say, well, on a lighter note, we have... <laughs> and I just, I, I knew we had touched a chord. And Justice For All was nominated for a Grammy Award, although it famously lost out to Jethro Tull, of all acts. But the critical tide was turning, as even New York Times writers began hailing Metallica's complex arrangements and pointed lyrics. Hey, look. We're in Rolling Stone, isn't that exciting? See? We made it into Rolling Stone. We peaked. Can only go down from here. I knew we had a really good record and I knew that it was going to do well. I would never in a zillion years think that five years later it's still ho hovering in the, in the top 100. In 1990, gearing up to record its fifth album, Metallica finally found a producer the band would come to value highly, veteran studio whiz Bob Rock. One of the first things Bob Rock ever said to me when I met him about five or six years ago in Vancouver was, you guys never you guys have never made a record that sounds like you sound when you play live. Let's go do a, a yeah. A yeah! At the end. Do something else. Womo! All right. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Fire, womo! Woma. 
I think we kind of all fessed up to the fact that we just needed to bring somebody else into our tightly knit organization and work with us in the studio. The typical Bob Rock scenario is me showing up and playing guitar and him looking at me and saying, come on, man. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll look at him and, and say, what? And he goes, you're much better than that. Come on. You don't want to put that on, on an album. Remember what I said about guitar players that don't do their homework? Remember, remember that. Hey, man, I do my homework. <laughs> I do, man. <laughs> it doesn't work. The resulting record, officially called Metallica, unofficially the Black Album, was unveiled at a fan listening party at New York's Madison Square Garden. And it was a smash, going to number one and finally winning a Grammy Award for Best Metal Album. Let's see, I think the first thing we gotta do is, obviously, like you guys were expecting, is we gotta thank Jethro Tull for not putting out an album this year, right? <laughs> I knew we had a really good record, and I knew that it was going to do well. I would never in a zillion years think that five years later it's still ho hovering in the, in the top 100 and selling, you know, whatever, X thousand copies. That we, I mean, who, who, who just bought the Black Album last week? The longevity, the, that, that's cooler to me than being on top for five minutes, really. Hanging out and, and still being relevant, and, and, and for some reason people are still buying the damn thing. Unending popularity of the Black Album wound up keeping Metallica on the road for two whole grueling years. If you at gunpoint forced me to name one gig that stands out, I'd probably say the gig we did in Moscow in uh, 1991. This was just elevated one, one step more than anything I've ever seen of us and working with an audience and, and, and it was the whole, that whole experience was, was truly amazing. After cranking out some 400 shows, the members of Metallica decided to take a whole year apart from each other before starting work on Load. The sound on, on this record it seems to indicate sort of a happier group. Uh, do you feel happier than you were oh, yes. 15 years ago? I, I don't know, but happier, less unhappy. Maybe. Has the songwriting process changed? The actual songwriting process haven't, hasn't changed that much. Um, it's still me and James who sit with the material, it's still me and James who put the songs together, the basic arrangements, um, everything like that. I think this time around we ended up using uh, more stuff of Kirk's. <laughs> Let's play Guess Who's Not in the Room. Bob! Producer Bob Rock was back on board for Load, of course, and Metallica itself was a changed band, rested, mature, and operating now with a new, more democratic spirit. It's like a band, you know? This is very weird, you know? Yeah, Lars and I back off a little and let them take a little control, you know, over their own, you know, parts. They kind of let down the guard a little bit and maybe let a little bit more responsibility go to the other cats in the band, Kirk and myself, and uh, let us um, be able to, you know, voice our opinions and show, really show our stuff this time. I mean, we're really doing everything backwards. Do you know what? I mean, most people have... They start as a band and then a couple guys take over and then everybody blows up. But we kind of, you know, started with a couple of guys running the show and then it becomes a band and now it's like a tighter thing than it's ever been before. It's, it's kind of weird. Not only is Load a major stylistic step for Metallica, but so is the band's choice of a venue to promote it as headliners on the earnestly alternative Lollapalooza tour. We're going to reach a lot of folks. Um, that we didn't before and gained some respect from some people that we didn't before and 
we're real happy with the songs. We're real proud of them. And that, that's going to make a, a big dent in a lot of people that maybe had their doubts. And that, that makes me happy, too. Musically, I think we're in a position right now where we could go anywhere and people would not necessarily maybe like it, but at least respect it. And I think that that's important. And um, at least understand that we have a desire to keep pushing the boundaries. And the only thing that will limit us will be our own imaginations. Yeah!